Yes, we're going. Welcome everyone to the Midwest We are going to be talking about freedom farming, spreading the message of liberty. This is So, spreading the message of freedom is obviously something that we all hear about because we're all here and we all have a I, I, there are videos out there that I've seen online that are really good and in just the introduction you know, for the basics of Bitcoin, like weusecoins.com is a really good one. I mean, yeah, does anyone want to do a sample Bitcoin transaction? I just got handed a sample paper wallet that's available for just that purpose. Well, I, I think that's something we all understand that's going to be inevitable. All right, all right, see, as soon as you're done, uh, I, I, I can do a single bit for you. It's that through the realization well, of freedom and the artists. society that's around us. And a lot of times people feel like this is a hopeless endeavor. We've all gone out, we've all talked to people, and we, we can't get through or whatever, and we feel like. So. You know, there's only a few thousand of us where it's not even our It seems like a hopeless um, That's not really the issue endeavor. Issue. And I just want to talk about the numbers behind that a little bit first. Um, um, all the so just, I kind of made up I a scenario. Imagine for a moment that like you are the only some voluntary some guys out there. Yes, they're all just you. Big. I'm completely lost. They're all alone. <laughs> well, so and you know that you want to spread like this I'm message to the world. You set out into the town and you start talking about freedom. I think we can kind of be talking about here in a moment with people and you talk to people, you talk to people, you talk to people. And after a year, you have found two people. Well, that's what I was saying. Does anyone have an internet connection who's going to be able to do a uh, sample Bitcoin uh, transaction? Because I am going to choose bars. Oh, you got two bars? That's way better than me. We do it. We do that. Even in the middle of nowhere. I have one bar of LTE. How do you spell my cell like this? Send fly bucks. So you decide to invite some more friends. Maybe you're, you can cut back in your cold a little bit. You're still going to go yeah. out and you're going to yeah. say, who wants to address what is a paper wallet? Well, the other gear. Who has a paper wallet? And at the end of that year, there's like, nine of them. Actually, quite. And you're still not very optimistic about having um, have that thought. Like, it's what global thing, but you're happy to have nine friends. Now you can get what is a big one? Tell us. You guys know what the point is. We want to know, Mike. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to sit down. And we're going to be, I know it's going to be another year to go out of the video for sure. This gentleman here is going to be user A. You're starting to throw maybe a festival. And then there's 729 for next year. By year 8, there's 6,000. And if someone has a piece of paper. You're doing it. In year 10, there's 59,000. Because each one of you went out. He's going to be our mind. We're speaking of our mind. We're going to write down A, B, C, D, D. Ten years just in that word. Skip ahead fourteen years. There are four million seven hundred and eighty two. Just so you guys know it's it's almost time to wrap this up. Yeah, right. I think we can do this. Year, right. and and the Twenty sure and a half years ago we can have every person on yeah. earth. Alright. And now uh, how many um MPLC coins would you like to start with? Ten. One person. Ten? So he just he just spoke that he just said ten in our minor. Let's see. So that's so that's the important to write down ten uh, underneath A because he heard and, uh, Mr. A address A say that he has and ten. Mike wanted to put this talk together about freedom farming. So how many does, does and he have? His ideas so far. and your ideas and you would about like how generation about process. And you get a reward for doing some money. You will say like put a have. Okay, I guess Mike, I uh I'm gonna go to an article a few months ago. Yeah. Just, I don't know, I've been doing it over a year, it's just 
Uh, no, no, he no, has so zero examples. If, if we do make it random, no, you don't want to put uh, too much on someone. You just put a bow with your plan a little seed, plan an idea. Uh, I kind of started doing that with my landscape business, so I noticed that I did it. Once Bruce figures it out, I don't know what they're early in. You know, a couple years later, they would have this idea. Who started their own idea? They're just going to die. So if you kind of get people something to think about, right now, it's pretty well, um, they won't necessarily get defensive. It's kind of, We're all minors you know, then. Convince them, them what uh, block start thinking yeah. about it. Okay. I'll, I'll start by re writing, reading the article, and uh, anytime anybody wants to jump in and add something, just uh, jump in, raise your hand, whatever. What is freedom? Is it free health care? Blockchain visible. Is it what sold the kill and die for? Freedom from hunger. These beliefs of and what freedom is, is are as foreign, scary, and absurd to our ears as the government of taxes and non-aggression principles. Don't mess it up. I would really like to say this. No state is a beer bottle. I don't know if already a beer bottle. I will give you no one word status main point. That they have had a lifetime of indoctrination. Most would probably consider themselves to be good people. How can we convince these good people that freedom does right, not right. come from forcing ten, other people ten, ten, to do a for that beer ball? So, I like to think of myself as from a freedom farmer. I'm going to sign I ten seeds of free thought whenever and wherever I can. Please send ten coins to the volunteer slash energist slash evolutionist to the libertarian listeners. And I'm saying I had, take ten uh, from my address. And of course, I know that for my most identity, people. If that I know for, for me, they're given out by too many libertarian ideas. Uh, I also find that it's almost yeah, impossible to change a person's mind about anything, let alone something as important. I got an apple pie. Who wants an apple pie for MPLC coin? Okay, and we are out of time. We are out of time at this point. The next event is the group photo. And that will be located right out here. Right out here. So everyone should gather the group photo. Yeah, it's right here. Included in the group photo. Thank you, everyone, for your question. I might point out that police brutality has much more to do with statism and the existence of a police state than it does with racism or how the war on drugs is all about money and very little to do with drug use or that taxes are not voluntary and are a form of slavery and armed robbery. I find that if I give them too much information they get overwhelmed or become argumentative or just think that I'm crazy. I don't hide anything or deceive people in any way I just try to get them to think for themselves. It's hard to do that if you overwhelm them or in a confrontational setting. So I try to plant seeds of free thought. I was having a casual conversation with a woman in a coffee shop last month. She seemed pretty open-minded, so I showed her a video depicting police brutality and asked her what she thought. We talked about the police and the drug war. I told her that I believe that Oh, I believe that she listened to me and she will see things differently in the future. Sometimes it's just a small idea, a comment or a question. In the past I have stated things about voting for the so-called two-party system that we have in the USA to friends. Months later I found that their position has changed. Uh, the other day I was with a customer and I made a couple texts back to Adam Kokesh about the event and was pretty excited and told the customer and showed him one of his videos and he's like, oh, this is really cool, you know, gonna, give me his name, I'm going to watch this when I'm at work. And so, uh, just little stuff like that get people thinking. You know, I have often find it difficult to thoroughly process new information during a conversation. I doubt others can easily do so either. Sometimes it's best just to present an idea and let the other person think about it at their own pace. Allow the idea to germinate and take root. Persuading someone to your point of view is good. Giving them the information and the time to come to conclusions on their own is more permanent and will have a greater effect on them. Everyone is different. Some people are hopeless statist and might not be worth talking to. But give them a small idea, maybe point out that the two-party system is really just the lesser of two evils. It is hard to argue with the statement that 
I believe all human interaction should be voluntary. Others may be voluntarist at heart, but have no concept of what that means. They might be able to handle more truth. The beautiful thing about liberty is that it makes sense. If a person is honest with themselves and is, is exposed to a way of looking at things that they may not be familiar with, they will often come to the same conclusions that I have. Getting someone to think about something is half the battle. Once that idea germinates and grows, once it becomes their own idea, then they may be, may be able to continue on the path to rejecting the state and embracing libertarian ideas, ideals. If you want the world to be a free place, freer place, this is one way that we can help bring about that change. So get someone thinking, plant a seed, become a freedom farmer. I have a Freedom Farmers Facebook page if anybody's interested. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Wood. Uh, I just wanted to expand on one point that Mike brought up that I thought was really important, and that is finding common ground with people. It's, it's incredibly important that you realize that you're not going to find a bunch of people who are just ready, already pre-made volunteerists. Uh, just, you just got to flip the switch and tell them the word. That if you're holding out for the perfect candidate to become a volunteerist, you're, you're not going to have any luck. You've got to find someone who you've got some common ground with, someone who believes in freedom on an issue or several issues that you can use as a wedge to try to expand their, their viewpoint. Luckily, on the flip side of that, because that's kind of depressing, is that uh, there's also not that many arch status. There's not going to find a lot of people out there like, oh, I hate freedom. <laughs> no, I, freedom? No, I'm, I'm against freedom. They do exist, though. They do exist, but they're, they're just as few and far between as the ready-made volunteers. So you've got to go where people are taking a stance on an issue, taking a pro-freedom stance on an issue, and uh, you just got to encourage them to go all the way, you know? Get, get involved with some more pro-freedom issues. I mean, I've gone to, to Tea Party rallies where people are like, I hate taxes. I'm like, I hate taxes, too. And then they're like, well, I hate brown people. And I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> So and I, went to, I went to Occupy, you know, which was the exact opposite. People were like, were like, I hate the big businesses that are, you know, getting all these subsidies. And, then, and I'm like, I hate that too. I think that's unfair. And they're like, yeah, so we need the government to help us. It's like, no, that's not the solution I would use. I mean, I'm, I'm the chairman of my local Libertarian Party branch. So, I mean, you meet lots of people who are pro-freedom. But they're not all the way pro-freedom. So it's just a matter of finding people who, who are excited about freedom on something and getting them excited about freedom in a broader sense. I think that's the, the best way to, to find converts for volunteerism. So that's why I'm Katie. Um, for me, it's just I'm a barber, so I get to meet a lot of different people. And I don't necessarily start asking them about all of this, but I kind of leave it more open to them and kind of say, well, what would be your idea of um, how you would live before, because we're just kind of born into this. We don't have a choice. So if they had a choice on how their ideal life would be and what they could do, they come up with, you know, first thing is, well, I don't want to work my nine to five, of course. so. And um, bills, everything, of course, they don't, they don't want to grow old being a slave. So um, I encourage people just to become more self-sustainable as possible because that helps along the way. And um, just really like what you were saying, kind of feel hopeless sometimes, but you're never not doing anything just, you know, like, it's the ripple effect. It, you throw a rock in the pond, it's no matter what, you're going to have an effect to people. So if you think you're not getting anywhere, um, later down the road, like Mike said, so if you think about an idea later, life is their own. So if you don't think it works, it is, no matter what, really, because once it gets started, it's going. But um, And then, like, the news is always on at my work, so I kind of... You know, if people are getting mad about something on the news, I poke in on that and um, kind of show them a new way because people tend to 
you know, I always bitch about the left and right, and it's like, well, why don't you step outside of that then, you know? There is another way. It's just kind of got to open the door for it, but that's all I remember. Got to be opportunistic. Yes. So. Anybody up there have any uh, examples of uh, ways they've shared the message of freedom with people that are? We got a success story over there. Um, if you could, um, I guess we could send a microphone out to you, or if you could come up. If you could just step here and say something. Just the one What's your name? Working very well. <laughs> this one's not working very well? I don't know. My name's Kyle. Kyle? And uh, I'm coming from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I guess my commentary would be maybe now it's worth okay. Keep it close. Okay, that's the issue. That's good. All right. Um, I just slightly before I became really interested in the liberty movement, I co founded a humanist group in Toronto. And as I moved towards becoming an anarchist, I definitely realized I'm surrounded by a lot of people that identify very strongly with the left. Um, and that sort of made me feel like there may be a falling out in the future between me and this humanist group. Uh, but I've been pleasantly surprised. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that uh, people within, that identify within the skeptic community, uh, although there's a lot of blind spots when it comes to government, uh, they tend to be skeptical and they tend to be able to, at least at certain times, keep their emotions sort of at a distance and actually consider things. And they might harass you for sources and facts, but I've I've been I've been pleasantly surprised. And because I've been sort of one of the founding members uh, within the format, we often discuss world news, and I can choose news events that can that people are pissed off about, and I can sort of put a spin on like potential solutions, potential reasons why this is even an issue, and. Uh, I, I, I've met with success, not success in the sense that they're going to walk around telling everybody that they're libertarians or they're anarchists, but in the sense that they realize that these problems are way more complex. It's not just a matter of pushing some new policy or we just got to like bribe the government or convince the government to do something new for us, that this is a reflection on our society as a whole, that we're really avoiding personal responsibility by always sort of appealing to the government. I think that's the biggest thing of like statism as a religion, that people maybe within religious communities have the sense that, uh, well, I'll just pray about it and God will figure it out. And they just sort of wander off uh, away from that person in need. And they sort of feel like they've done all they can do and God will work his magic behind the curtain and it'll get done somehow. And I think the same thing comes with the government where people are sort of drawn towards being a little sociopathic just because it's like, well, the government is the best solution creator, so they'll figure it out. Like, sure, I could help this person, but I'm already paying into the welfare program, so they'll figure it out. And I, we have That's the Scrooge solution. Yeah, so I mean, that, I'll, I'll just stop at this point, but I think I've been able to put a more nuanced view, because a lot of people are like, oh, I knew some libertarians in college, and they were just shit disturbers, and they just like interrupting everybody, and they liked having free speech walls that they could just write offensive language on and like there definitely are people within this community that maybe haven't made it the easiest for people to realize there is nuance and sophistication and and like deep thought in this but i've been surprised with the skeptic community it just has to do with how you approach it maybe i'm very familiar to what you do with the lp yeah definitely and i think he really touched on what's important is i now i may not be the perfect person to practice what i preach but it's important to take a compassionate uh, outlook towards people and find common ground rather than taking a uh, uh, confrontational. Confronta confrontational outlook towards everybody uh, and, and trying to, to change their mind. Start on what you guys agree with and try to expand from there rather than uh, jumping down people's throats on what you disagree with them on. I find that um, sometimes I can be real forceful in my arguments and you know, I'll just beat people into agreeing with me, but they don't agree with me. They just you just wear them out sometimes, and it's a lot easier if you can let them do the thinking. And half the time or more, they'll they'll come to the right conclusions. How much time did it take you to go from the point of time where you would have considered yourself a statist, and the point of time when you considered yourself a libertarian or anarchist? 
Um, and you, do, do you take that in account when you're talking with someone who obviously hasn't decided to Yeah, yeah. I was uh, probably, a, I didn't know what a minarchist was until the last couple of years, but I would probably have been a minarchist for the last 30 years ever since, you know, I realized the bullshit of the uh, Republican and Democrat Party, but uh, I came from a libertarian point of view to more of a minarchist point of view. And then maybe a couple of years ago, I started going on Facebook and arguing with people, and uh, I don't know, somebody uh, said that, you know, it's not going to be long before you're a, an anarchist, and it's like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> a couple months later, I couldn't argue anymore, you know, it's like, but, but I, I did. I tried to be honest with myself, and so I think I had, I was ready for the message, it's more, more than most people, but I just try to, uh, you know, find common ground, you know, police brutality, you know, really leads well into the drug war and all that, so. What's, uh, how do you share liberty? Hey, my name is Christian so see, um, I, I kind of gave up, <laughs> so, which I'm glad to be here because hopefully you guys maybe can re-motivate me, but um, I used to I used to walk around nagging everyone at work and you know my social circles about oh you know, have you checked the news you know this is what's going on right now and um, I found that um, it, it's usually ineffective. Um, now I'm more now like a, a I'm open to conversations, but you're gonna have to initiate it with me. And I walk around, I got my bag with all my buttons and the shiny badges and whatnot. So I mean, just the last week, I got my block badge, my bag. I walk into a bar, and these four um, really good-looking black girls <laughs> they say like, oh, "Are you a cop?" And uh, no, here we go. So we have a good conversation about cop rocking, about police brutality, black lives, and all that. So, so I, I, I let the opportunity come up. I look for them. I will, I will, I'll, I'll come here. I'm very happy to talk about it. But I, I stop being like, I'm going to convince you because that just never works. That's good. I'm, you don't want to harangue people. You, you don't want to harangue people into liberty because no one likes being harangued. So, yeah. waiting for an opportunity where they express an interest in a pro freedom stance, that's exactly when you, you, you're, it's your, your green light to engage. Right. Yeah, I, um, I work in a union job, and I don't <laughs> talk freedom too much at work. <laughs> so a side note, like several years ago, my mom's like a Rush Rip Limbaugh Republican, and all the guys at work are like hardcore left Democrats, party line, you know, Democrats are helping the unions, blah, blah, blah. And I, I told her once, I go, you know, you sound exactly like the people at work, only you say opposite things. She got kind of mad, but so I don't, I don't. I, I choose my battles. I don't bother with somebody who's just going to argue with you because you're just wasting your time and you're just going to get aggravated because they're <laughs> you're going to think they're idiots. <laughs> how, how purist are you guys when you talk about freedom? I'm the purest of purists. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying, there's, a, there's a Ron Paul approach, right? Pure, and there's a Rand Paul approach. I'm going to compromise to hopefully find some common ground and. Well, well, it's yeah, good to find common ground, but you don't want to misrepresent your position. So that's why, like I said, I, I, I take a very pure stance, but I don't insist that everyone agree with me on everything, because obviously it's never going to happen. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't hide anything. I don't, I don't hide my stance, but I don't necessarily go out to somebody and say, I'm an anarchist, either. I might say volunteerist, or I might just not use the word, because a lot of people just get scared away. But. There's no question that I'll, I'll lie to or misrepresent because we don't have to, you know. It's, it's all about just giving it to them in increments so they don't, you know, just a tip. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, since we've been talking a lot about finding common ground with people, you know, an example of something that I might say to someone who's completely economically illiterate, um, um, typically, like say, from the left side of the spectrum, um, you know, they tend to be very concerned about the um, the outcome of life for poor people, and so I'll talk about that with them, and, I, and I'll say, you know, it, it sounds like you would you really care about um, the uh, outcome that these poor people are experiencing, the quality of life that they have, um, their access to. They, um, the needs of life, food, clothing, shelter, 
in um, health healthcare, all, all of the above. And then I will just point out, you know, if, if you really want to help these people, it would be excellent for you to um, take some time and learn some things that can help them. And here is this guy who, he was an economist, and he really cared about poor people the same way that you care about poor people. And he wrote this really short book, it's less than 200 pages long, that goes through the details of how it is you create a society where poor people can flourish. And then I will send them a link to Economics in One Lesson from Henry Hazlitt. And I have had liberals tell me that they were intrigued by this presentation of this material. I don't know if they actually read it or not, but I shared some of the ideas that were in the book, um, several of the economic lessons um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, and I found this approach works with the liberals. Um, and I just picked liberals because that's something that I'm more familiar with. I, there are certainly ends with, with conservatives as well. As well. I think that's just one example I have. Yeah, I just wanted to share a similar example of, of like economic one lesson. Um, often within the context of the humanist group, we end up talking about how could we improve society. Um, if we're talk, discussing poverty, what sort of programs we would be advocating within the government. And I think one thing that just jars people's minds is like, and, and this is because there is a number of libertarians within the humanist group, and posing the question of, okay, so this program has these claims, what metrics can we use to distinguish their progress? How can we measure and quantify if this program is working, if it's achieving what it's claiming to achieve? And most people are just, they don't, they've never even thought about it. And it's like, how, how, what, what's sort of the trajectory of this program? When, when do we forecast the ability to disband it or to start shrinking it? And once again, just like, well, if there was a point at which there, there was not a welfare program and humans were still alive, then we should be able to predict an efficient welfare program would get rid of the need for itself. And, and how would we measure this? And with any of these government programs, and that's something that I feel like you get the, you get the high ground if you can word that correctly in the context of that type of discussion because people generally don't have any answers and people haven't really done the research to see how these programs have, that have been running for decades and decades aren't getting any better, aren't getting any more efficient, aren't really doing what they're claiming to do. Just need more money. Not, not only are they not doing the things that they claim to do, um, and this is something that I'll say to them as well, is that um, these programs actually hurt the very people that they're trying to help. You have to be very careful about throwing that one out there because um, sometimes that can sound a little bit abrasive. Context is everything. Yeah, it, it, yeah, you have to be very careful throwing that out there, but you can definitely throw that out to there. know your audience. Yeah, yeah, you have to know your audience before you can say that. But um, I, I definitely like to use the phrase, if you really care about poor people, if you really care about their outcome, if you really care if they have access to the needs of life, then you'll take the time to learn what works so that you can stop advocating things that hurt them. What? One thing that seems to work uh, is maybe on Facebook or you know you're with somebody you can show them a video, maybe a police meeting video. I had a guy, neighbor of mine, bet me a hundred dollars, you know, a couple months ago that the police don't kill more than a hundred people a year. So it was like a real bad week, and I started messaging them like every day, and then they. Police actually killed somebody in the city of Gibraltar, which was only 5,000 people where we live. And I messaged them that. It was that close enough to home for you, Kevin? But, um, you, you know, showing videos like uh, Katie often uses the uh, Jones Plantation video to, you know, get people. It's just a really good thing. If you, if you know any videos, and uh, do you want to describe that video for us briefly, Katie? Uh, just really saying how democracy is still slavery. But um, I did give the. Uh, what is that? Statism, the most dangerous religion. To uh, I told it. Yeah, yeah. I gave that to a state cop, and I haven't seen him come back yet. So, <laughs> but um, another thing is like, 
when you're going to tell someone something like, oh, this really fun thing happened, and then you, oh, let me call you back real quick. They're anticipating like to hear the news, you know? So instead of laying all the info down on someone, <clears throat> like before I came here, I'm like, oh, going to Liberty Fest, and customers are like, well, what's that? What do you do there? So I mentioned Bitcoin, then they start asking about that. You just leave it open for them to ask questions on what they're interested in instead of just kind of force feeding them information. But the videos really do help because they go, you know, you get 15 minutes for a haircut, you don't have much time to talk, but then they go home with homework and uh, when they come back, you know, they start to talk more and more. So each time they come back, they're a little more uh, on the path of freedom, I would say, and understand it more. and. Um, a lot of them have kids, you know, so they're gonna raise them that way. But like you said, it's I find two people, like two people a day at my work to just spread the message, you know, and it, it really helps. Sometimes we gang bang at them. <laughs> I've done it in a bar before. Uh, somebody or a guy was over at my house a few weeks ago, and I think we were getting through to him, but the wives were getting like, ah, oh, these people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't say this around my 10 year old. I'm like purposely the saying these things around the 10 year old. The 10 year old is the most important person you can get. Yeah, I mean, they are. They're yeah. the person who's going to be my, uh, open to new ideas. My ex brother in law was getting angry at me because my niece was talking about joining the uh, military. And I was like, oh. I think I asked Brantley. I go, Brantley, help me out with this one. <laughs> so we uh, talked to her. He was getting a little upset, but I think that was a really critical. Point, Did so. you succeed in rescuing that situation? I don't know. I haven't talked to her, but I, I know she started thinking some more, so hopefully. Uh, but um, yeah, the Freedom Farmers page, if anybody could uh, go on there and just share your ideas. If you got like a video that's good to show a, a status or, or just something that you did. I was hoping it to become, there's not much activity on there, but I was hoping it would become just a, like a forum where we can discuss different ways to spread the message of liberty to people other than ourselves. Any more questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, so, so far we're talking about interest and finding common ground, but uh, Kate, I think you brought up like the, uh, the, the statism as a religion, right, in, in, in the books that the, what's the name, uh, Lark and Rogue, you know, wrote, you know, The Greatest Superstition. Uh, when I read that, I'm like, wow, this, you know, it's a really powerful message. But it's also a little discouraging in the sense that uh, it's very much a faith, right? So now you're approaching someone, you're talking with them, uh, you know, in, in almost in, in uh, anti-religion, you know, you're against their religion, right? You know, and they might not even recognize statism as their religion, but their actions, you know, clearly demonstrate that. How, do you call that out, or how, how do you how do you I manage the no. religious fervor? I, uh, I would say, like I said before, I think that confronting people on their deep set beliefs is not a way to convince them. Yeah. It's not going to be effective. Yeah. The best thing you can do is try to engage them on your common interests, common beliefs, common issues, and uh, and work from there. Be like, you know, if they agree with you on taxation, you know, if they're like a conservative style person, you know, and then start talking to them about, well, what about all the money you spend on the military? How how is that fair? So I mean, you you. Can, Work taxation and other issues into their applications for broader issues. Yeah, I think some people are just, you know, I saw this lady, she was a prosecutor in one of the police killings, and she said, uh, at least for something recently, and she's like, well, we have a black woman prosecutor, and a black woman judge, and a, a black woman this, and if we can't fix this situation, nobody can, but like this person is so ingrained her life. She said, I spent my whole life, you know, I went to the right school to, to be of service. That someone like that, how can you, you, they would have to change their very existence yeah. to, to really, to get the message. So some people, you might be able to bring up a little thing. Some people, it's just not worth trying to talk to. It's, it's just finding common ground with the people that, uh, you know, and the people that are maybe cops or something like that, maybe point out certain things and like, get a little doubt, but yeah, some people are just too far gone and they're never going to get over their religion. You can't convert, you know, a religious person. I don't know. 
that he said that he's already somewhere else that he had, had to be. All right, we got any more questions or comments? Nope. Oh, okay. Just curious if you had any success in starting out the conversation, like, well, maybe initially they find out you have libertarian leanings, but before you get too much into the logical details of it, you sort of explain why this worldview appeals to you. Have you ever approached it from that perspective of like what drew you towards it? Uh, can you extrapolate a little bit? Yeah, no, I'm just thinking, um, like, in, in my experience, uh, I sort of realized I put so many logical reasons why the libertarian worldview or the anarchist worldview is the most coherent worldview, let's say, and people just sort of say, well, yeah, but you sound kind of paranoid. Like, what, what are you so worried about? Like, I haven't had the cops beat me down. I haven't had, I don't feel like I'm taxed too much. Like, what's the big deal? And then they try to sort of, not even intentionally sort of paint you as like somebody in the Alex Jones camp where you're just constantly ranting about all these horrible things that don't seem to touch the people's actual lives. So wait, yeah. you've met people in Ontario who don't feel like they're taxed enough? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it all goes to magical places. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that's why I just try to give it out in little doses because, you know, you start talking to someone and they're like, oh yeah, I agree, and then you can, you can really lay it on them, you know, but most people you just want to give them one little thing to think about and, you know, not, not too much at once. I, I feel like... In, in my experience, I have some credibility when I do get into that story, and I sort of wish I would have learned to get into my story earlier, actually. I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, which is essentially a Christian cult, if anybody knows it. They sort of hide in plain sight. Um, but because I can sort of show them the corrupt power structures within the religion, and then... Watchtowers. Yeah, the Watchtower. And then show them, like, the parallels, and how, like, when I watched or read the book 1984, I saw all of these, I saw my religion, and that book helped me get out of the religion, but then I awakened to a world where this is the whole world. And I feel like that gets some credibility if you can show people, it isn't just illegitimate paranoia. There's actual things that have impacted me in my personal life because of the way society's organized. This isn't just hypothetical things that could happen in the future. Like, I've been touched by corrupt power structures, so that's why I see them, <laughs> maybe more than people that have that uh, should be very helpful. That's uh, good if you can use your own experiences like that. Anybody have anything to add to this discussion or questions or examples? We have a hand for your hand back here. How are you doing? Um, the one thing I find, I live in a city that is Fernell, Michigan, and it's very anti corporate. Like, we had a B-dubs that lasted for a little while, and that ended up closing down. And the people in my community, like, they know there's problems. They know that the government is married to the corporations. They know the government and the banks are draining the money out of us and filtering it up to, to them. And, you know, they'll sit there talking to me about the problems, and one question that I always ask is, who is the common denominator? Who is there in all these problems? Trade is never going to stop. We are always going to trade. But government is the common denominator that will always make things difficult and steal money from people. And, and it, when I tell these people this, like they get it. Like they do get it. But some of them will go, oh, well, it's because the Democrats are in charge right now or the Republicans are in charge right now. And it's like, how many times are we going to go back and forth? between Democrats and Republicans and still have the same problems. That's the definition of insanity. Right. <laughs> I love your shirt, by the so, way. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so, I, I kind of just plant that in there, like the government is a common denominator between all the problems that you can think of. And, you know, hopefully that gets in their head and maybe we just don't need it. <laughs> so, but, you know, it is hard to throw like a Rothbard book at them and say, read this. <laughs> you know, but, uh, Hopefully they, you know, sometimes they come to me with more questions and, you know, I can help them with that, but that's my experience. I, I do have a little freedom farming anecdote to share with you guys. Um, one time I was at a meetup group and I met a girl there who I later asked out on a date and 
Uh, I was a meetup group from meetup.com, and my name in the group had the word voluntary. It might have been like Joe Voluntarist or something like that. Um, so I go on a date with this girl, and she notices that my name had said that, and so she asked me about this. You know, why, why, is, why are you a voluntarist? What does that mean? I love the word voluntarist um, because it's such a mind-opening word. Mike had mentioned something earlier about who could be against the definition of voluntarism, that all human interaction should be voluntary. And so I just gave that definition to her and didn't really tell her what it meant. And she, her brain got to thinking. She worked with children. So immediately we had this whole discussion about peaceful parenting. It didn't even come into the conversation for like 20 minutes. We started exploring other areas where there's coercion in our lives and we, we just kind of went from area to area about places that interactions aren't voluntary and how they would be if they were. And like I said, it took us 20 minutes before we got to the idea that the state, the entire operation of the state is coercive in nature. And that it, in order to believe in all human interaction being voluntary, you would also have to eliminate the state. And it was a really interesting way of going about it. It's the only time I've ever had the conversation flow in that way. And it was because that is what was important to her. And all I gave her was the definition of voluntarism. And she took the conversation where she wanted to take it. And I think it was a great conversation. Did you have something to say, Patrick? I had a question. Come on up. All right, come on up. Patrick works here and is uh, in heaven because we're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are my favorite group. <laughs> I was, I got up here a little late, so sorry if you maybe have to cover this. But yeah. sure. I wanted to ask if, uh, I know you guys are fans of like uh, School Sucks Project, and I'm pretty obsessed with the Trivium. And I was curious, like, how much you guys try to bring the Trivium into your concepts and talk about it and promote it. And what your feelings are on that, and for if anybody knows what it is. I mean, I have a little bit, and not real well at teaching it, but I had mentioned it to a friend just about, you know, her kids and stuff. I, I got a bit of an opinion on that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> great question, sir. And uh, <laughs> just another random joke, so you know, take, take that for what it's worth. But so uh, we love, yeah. love the trivia. Uh, and, and for those who don't know, it's essentially, at, at least as described by School Sucks, there's a lot of history around it too. But as described in that podcast, trivia is how you learn. And, and there's three steps to it, three. You know. uh, the first one is the grammar, right? You lay out all the, the facts about something. Then you apply your mind, your logic to it. You now, okay, well, this fact plus that fact. Oh yeah, they, you know, you gotta bring the wheel and the, the the steering wheel in order to steer a car. That makes sense, right? So you start putting the the, 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 the facts together into a logic, which is the second step of the trivium. The third step is called rhetoric, and rhetoric's got a you know weird sense nowadays, but at least as meant in the trivium, rhetoric means. You, you can know everything about something. You can understand the whole grammar. You can have all the stuff figured out logically in your head. But until you go out there and talk about it or interact or make it real, then you're just, you're just a thinker, right? So I think your question is very pertinent to what we're talking about here, right? I could have read all of Rothbard's human act. No, that's Mises. Mises, human action, Rothbard, whatever, Medicon, in state. And I know, you know, freedom. But if I never talk or I never interact with people about it, I think you're, you're kind of missing the point. Or if it, and it's not just about convincing others. If I never live it or, or, or make it real in my life, uh, then I'm not free. I'm just a uh, freedom academic. And you know, uh, you're missing the, the third part of the th trivium, I think, is the most important. I, I also think it's important to remember that they, they have to be in order. You cannot get your grammar, logic, and rhetoric out of that order, which is, as far as I understand it, is how it is taught. You know, with logical fallacies and logic as it's taught today, like it's only the Ivy League schools that really and teach the proper order of the show. And I would like to explain it as you shouldn't think about something until you've learned about it. You shouldn't talk about it until you've thought about it, and you shouldn't think about it until you've learned about it. 
And another example I know is like, you can't go into a restaurant and eat and then order and then look at the menu. You know, but people don't like the chicken because they don't like to be told how to think. They want to be told what to think. And I, I that's think sort of the issue. I think that's the best definition of the trivium I ever heard. It's, it's, I bet I read it like 50 times and that's really <laughs> brought it together for me. Um, I think it'd be wonderful if there's an opening in the schedule if you two guys could uh, chair a panel on the trivia. I'm busy with all. It's talking at eight. I don't know. Tomorrow? Or <laughs> yeah, if you two guys could do a thing on the trivia, well, the trivia is wonderful. I think a lot of people would get a lot of out of that. I have a slot at seven, and I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to talk well, about yet. Talk, talk, talk <laughs> it all. We're going to be around with Joe. All right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, um, okay, yeah. Anyway, we're going to be wrapping this up and uh, starting the uh, nonviolent communication. Uh, I would just encourage anybody out here to, uh, you know, plant some seeds of freedom. Find, find someone, anything. I, I usually use current events. Police beatings are happening every day, stuff like that. Uh, anything you see in the news is always a good topic. And I'd also encourage you, if you have any uh, ideas or methods or things that work for you, to you know, put them on the Freedom Farmers Facebook page. I, really like that to be a resource just for us to kind of spread the message to everyone else. Here you go. Hey, in four minutes we're going to have Katie Testa talking here about uh, nonviolent communication. So stick around. Stick around for that.